Okay. Good morning, everybody. It's, uh, according to my watch, 9 o'clock, and if we get started on time, hopefully we'll get everybody in with uh, no problems. Uh, the session this morning, I'm Steve Ram. Uh, I'm our treasurer and chair of this uh, session. Uh, the session is called um, Label Histories. Very simple. Uh, we've got three different labels and three different types of genres. Uh, first speaker is going to be Uncle Dave Lewis, as the separate from David Lewis, uh, who's another ARSC member here. Uh, Uncle Dave Lewis is no stranger to ARSC. He joined ARSC in 1999 and first presented at the Santa Barbara ARSC Conference in 2002. He started out as a key functionary in the Cincinnati underground music scene of the 1980s and ran his own indie label, Hospital Records. Uh, in 1991, he traveled to New York to complete production of Unsane's debut album, Unsane Hospital Records, there's a theme here, uh, for Matador Records at the request of the band. In the 90s, Uncle Dave was a classical music manager at the West Coast, on the West Coast for Tower Records and Virgin Mega Store chains, and subsequently spent a decade as an in-house editor for the All Music Guide. Today is presenting for us a topic dear to his heart as a native since, give me this word, Cincinnatian, uh, and one of the first scholars to take up research in the field of Cincinnati recording industry, the king of them all, the legacy of Cincinnati's King Records, 1943 to 1971, Uncle Dave. Thank you very much. This painting just went up in Cincinnati in September, and uh, it's part of an ongoing series of paintings of people in Cincinnati entertainment. The next one, I understand, is going to be Rosemary Clooney. Um, city of Cincinnati, which is two hours due, two and a half hours due west of where we are, um, has and had a recording industry. Um, however, it particularly flourished in the 1940s until the 1980s. The charge was led by King Records, a post-war indie industry innovator and leader in the production of niche genres such as country, rhythm and blues, gospel, bluegrass, soul, and funk. At its peak, King was the sixth largest record company in the United States and had 33 distribution outlets nationwide. Okay. There we go. And uh, I actually was supposed to put this slide um, under that talk, but this is where we need to go. Sid Nathan um, had, by 1943, undertaken a variety of business ventures, none successful, and was running a shop on Central Parkway in Cincinnati called Sid's Record Store. No one's ever found a photo of it, by the way, um, which sold ju used jukebox records. When Sid started King Records in September 1943, the major labels hadn't released a new record uh, in over a year. Um, owing to the AF AFM recording ban, his customers complained about there not being anything new and not being able to find records of performers that they like to listen to on local radio like WLW and WCKY. Um, so um, in September of 43, uh, he took two of those artists, Grandpa Jones and Merle Travis, uh, from WLW up to a radio station in Dayton and recorded them under the phony name of the Shepherd Brothers. And me, may we have track one, please. <laughs> Oh, 
something else kind She'll leave you behind With an aching heart And a weary mind As you can hear, the first King record is not awesome and circulated <laughs> in so few copies that Grandpa Jones believed that it had never been released. Only when a fan sent him one did Grandpa Jones learn the truth. These discs were silent for the first 20 or 30 seconds of the side and um, sold so poorly on, that uh, the launch almost sent the newly crowned king to the coroner rather than to a coronation. After some negotiating some refinancing through his family, Sid Nathan's King relaunched after the AFFM recording ban with the same talent, but adding uh, the Delmore brothers, Hank Penny and Cowboy Copas, recording in the newly established Herzog studio at 611 Race Street in Cincinnati. One of Copas's early discs hit hard and put King Records on a firm footing. Next uh, audio, please. Then the sailors gathered round him just to look upon her face, smiling face. And he said, I love my dark face, Filipino. She's my Filipino, baby, she's my treasure and my pet loving face. moved swiftly into the upper ranks of the country music market, aided and abetted by expert staff musicians from WLW and WCKY. Overall, King's activity in country music stretched from the era of hillbilly and honky-tonk through the rise of blue, bluegrass, and they had on their roster at one time or another Hawkshaw Hawkins, Charlie Gore, Zeb Turner, Moon Mullican, Wayne Rainey, J.E. Maynard, Charlie Feathers, Delbert Barker, Reno and Smiley, the Delmar, Carlisle, York, Stanley, and Osborne brothers, and Southern Gospel Shouter, um, bro brother Claude Ely. Um, King shellac pressings of these discs can sound pretty noisy, but there is an alternative. Around 1950, King struck up a distribution deal in Canada with quality records, and the Canadian vinyl pressings are superb. Next audio, please. <laughs> Like a ship at sea that's lost without a sail The dark clouds hide the sun from up above And even with these broken dreams My heart will never fail For deep inside there's only one true love I'll sail my ship alone Though all the dreams I own Drifting out across the ocean blue I'll sail my ship alone Though all the sails you've torn And when it starts to sink Then I'll blame you While recording at Herzog, King picked up its first client jobs. The earliest may have been Northern Kentucky nightclub performer Larry Vincent who started out recording straight songs, but soon switched to the naughty variety, which had defined his popularity at the Lookout House in Covington across the river. His Pearl Records, pressed by King, became the top-selling label for a time in the under-the-county party racket, um, party record racket, a rather odd distinction for conservative Cincinnati. Um, next audio, please. She's got freckles on her foot, she is nice And when 
She's in my arms, it's paradise. She was born in Hackensack. She made a fortune on her career. She's got freckles on her, but she is nice. She's got freckles on her, but she is nice. And when she's in my arms, it's paradise. She drinks till she gets plastered. She gets drunker than my brother. She's got freckles on her, but she is nice. Thank you. King also pressed a label the Herzogs instituted themselves, radio artist, your radio friends on records. This also answered the call for recordings of radio people from WLW and WCKY, though with a little more local rather than regional focus. Radio artist was ultimately taken over by Jimmy Skinner, who used the visibility to provide it in order to move into a contract with Mercury. Along the way, however, some very interesting things appeared on this label, such as the three steps featuring guitarist Del Staten. Next audio, thank you. sure how he got that effect in 1948 because I don't think they had volume pedals for the guitar before 1963 so your guess is as good as mine okay um, the Herzog Studios Stid stopped using it in 1947 uh, when he built his own studio on Brewster Avenue however they kept going recording for MGM and Mercury and other labels, artists like Hank Williams and Patti Page. And um, it's still there. It's the only place left where Hank Williams actually recorded. It's um, administered by the uh, Cincinnati Music Heritage Foundation, and you can arrange to tour it. And I suggest that you do sometime. Next audio, please. All aboard for Nashville! Good night, Cincinnati, and good morning, Tennessee. I'm heading into Nashville just as happy as can be. Hear the Mayfield drivers rolling, they're talking just to me. They say good night, Cincinnati, good morning, Tennessee. By 1953, performance rights organizations and the AF of M began to lean on country and western television programs such as WLW's Midwestern Hayride, causing them to make drastic reductions in their staff. At the same time, the recording industry in Nashville was beginning to gather steam and offering more work. This caused a mass exodus of expert country pickers from Cincinnati to Nashville between 1953 and 1956, which impacted King's country music program. The last new country and western releases from King arrived in 1964. After that, it consisted only of reissues. Incidentally, uh, once in the Ice House on Brewster Avenue, which I mentioned, Sid Nathan re-recorded practically his entire 1944-1946 country slate with the same artists. And there's nothing in the dead wax that will tell you which version you might have. However, the label design is the best clue. If it's on the left, that's a mid-40s king. And if it's on the right, it's a later remake. Uh, Sid Nathan hadn't placed all of his... Uh, 
eggs in one basket. Right after Filipino baby put King on the throne, he began test marketing rhythm and blues records through his short-lived Cincinnati label, using masters from black and white in New York. At least one of these couplings appeared only on Cincinnati, this one by Enos Washington. Um, and later in 1945, he launched the Queen label, which represented his formal entry into R&B and gospel full time, uh, initially using a wide range of local and regional talent, in addition to masters garnered from elsewhere. In 1947, Sid established an important connection to band leader Lucky Millinder, whose stable of talent broke out King's R&B program, uh, beginning with this number by saxophonist Bull Moose Jackson. Next audio, please. <laughs> There is a slight problem with the PowerPoint, but we're gonna work on it and I'll just continue. The association with Lucky Millinder also brought arranger and producer Henry Glover into the fold. By 1951, Henry Glover was a vice president at King and his authority there changed the very nature of the company. King Records was one of the first fully integrated organizations in America outside of the auto industry and the military. It became so in 1947 when Sid Nathan decided that he no longer wanted to pay for two segregated annual company picnics. <laughs> Sid Nathan encouraged Henry Glover to mix up the country musicians with the R&B players in the sessions with a goal of creating a unique and a different kind of house sound. And of course, this is the very recipe that makes up rock and roll. And its effect on the records is pretty immediate. Next audio, please. <laughs> It's a constant on King Records from 1947 to the early 60s. Even if some of it isn't rock and roll in a generic sense, King's sound was certainly one of the driving forces behind the development of the style. On and it's found on both country and R&B records. Drummer Philip Paul is a present day survivor of the period. Originally from New York, he settled in Cincinnati with Tiny Bradshaw's band and recorded his first King session backing up Bone Moose Jackson on his record, Big Ten Inch Record, on October 6, 1952. Uh, Philip Paul continued as a staff drummer with King until the very end in 1971. Today, he plays a gig every Saturday night at the Cincinnati Inn Hotel and he remembers playing on rock, rockabilly, country, R&B, soul, and jazz sessions, and s remembers that he loved all of the music, but he didn't really love working for Sid Nathan, who was a big distraction in the studio. Um, 
Let's go to the next audio. You'll hear a country record and then a well-known King R&B record. Daddy O, sure good looking daddy O, daddy O, always looking daddy O, daddy O, ready to go. Bonnie Lou, all the girls are body over daddy O. You couldn't call him handsome, but he's loaded with style. Always wears a t-shirt and a great big smile. There's something about this crazy kid we all love so. But he's around the girls who holler daddy O, daddy O, daddy O. R&B Slate is itself quite awesome. Uh, they recorded Earl Bostic, Ivory Joe Hunter, Lonnie Johnson, Big Maybell under the name of Mabel Smith, Clarence Gate Mount Moore, um, uh, Eddie Lockjaw Davis, Eddie Cleanhead, Vincent Memphis Slim, Tiny Bradshaw, Todd Rhodes, Roy Brown, Little Willie John, Freddie King, Otis Williams and the Charms, The Dominoes, Hank Ballard and the Midnighters, Joe Tex, Boyd Bennett, Hard Rock Gunter, Lula Reed, and the Five Royales. Um, however, it didn't score an actual rock and roll hit until 1956, and it was with one of the fellows that came from Lucky Millinder's stable, organist Bill Doggett, that broke the ice. Next audio. <laughs> Records was technically a post-war indie, a startup from the end of World War II, and as, as such, it emerged with a lot of other startup labels that were banking on post-war prognostications about what the record industry was going to be like, and they were thinking that early investors were going to reap a big dividend. Uh, well, instead of post-war boom, it was post-war bust. And all of those under overextended outfits started to go down. Um, there were guys like Eli Oberstein that would buy a catalog off the receiver's index and then use it to fuel um, releases of junk records. But Sid Nathan was a little different in that he would buy an interest in a struggling company and keep it going for a while until it truly failed and then he would absorb the label into his 
uh, operation down to the imprint and keep it running that way. Um, in 1945, Merle Travis resettled in Hollywood and uh, when Grandpa Jones got back from the war, uh, he s stated that he wanted to continue working with Merle. So in order for that to happen, Sid Nathan needed to have a place in Los Angeles to record. So he bought a share in a studio um, called Belltone, which had its own failing post-war indie, propped them up for a while, and then uh, even after they ended the label, he continued to use the studio for decades afterward. They did reactivate Belltone in 1961 in order to issue the King distributed hit Tossin' and Turning Turnin by um, Bobby Lewis. Thank you. Um, the deluxe label, uh, and hopefully we'll have the PowerPoint back pretty shortly. Yeah, there it is. And we'll just uh, take it up to, I'll show you the Belltone label that I have. And it's actually a record by uh, Merle Travis under a phony name. Um, but we'll continue with the text. Um, the deluxe label was started in 1944 by brothers David and Jules Braun of Linden, New Jersey. And um, by mid-1947, their warehouse had burnt down and they were in trouble. So uh, Sid Nathan bought uh, an interest in their company. Uh, then they entered into a partnership with a label called Milton Records that was uh, run by uh, Roy Milton. And um, one of the partners in Milton, Forrest War Perkins, absconded with their funds, ran away to the Philippines, and suddenly died under mysterious circumstances. <laughs> so they were in trouble again. And, and what happened was Sid Nathan uh, bought what was left of Deluxe and incorporated the entire catalog into King. And he also used the label as a way to test market 45 RPM singles, which was new to him. Uh, he inherited Ruth Wallace's catalog, early catalog, and even though she went and re-recorded everything for her own label, uh, Sid Nathan was putting out her old records up until the 1960s. So, and uh, yeah, it looks like uh, we're about here. Um, but, yeah, uh, okay, well then maybe we should just keep going and, and abandon the PowerPoint. Okay, so, um, yeah, okay, very well. Um, King continued to make 78s until 1959, didn't make a 45 until 1951, they didn't enter the LP market until 1952, and that was with 10-inch LPs only. King switched to 12-inch in 1956. Uh, Sid briefly partnered with Eli Oberstein with his early LPs. They were split, supposed to put out 60 or 70 releases uh, that were identical, uh, on both King and on Obie's varsity label. However, um, Obie made like a dozen more than was under the contract and um, uh, started to make more money than Sid Nathan. So that ended. And some of those records are extremely rare. Some have never been found. It was a very short-lived uh, situation. Um, another among other labels that King owned or distributed, there was a label called Glory, based in Florida, that was owned by Henry Stone, that Sid bought out in 1953 so he could get the artists, and he also brought Stone along as a producer. Henry Stone was with King until the very end uh, in 1971, and later founded TK Records. Audio Lab was another label that King introduced in the late 50s. 
to in an attempt to compete in the cheap LP market and Audio Lab actually went to stereo before the main King label did. Um, uh, the festival label was a, a, a distributed label that brought the talent of Gene Pitney to King, but his greatest successes lay ahead of him, as was the case for Billy Joe Royal, whose efforts on the Fairlane label were distributed by King, but his biggest hit down in the boondocks came on Columbia. Trini Lopez was also did two albums on King before he was picked up by Reprise and Frank Sinatra. Other labels handled by King Records at one time or another, including Agape, Huron, Kim, Keys, Rockin', Roseanne, and Willow. And then uh, we don't have the PowerPoint, so I won't go into the matter of client labels and, and custom jobs. King did hundreds of those. Uh, Bethlehem was uh, a label started in 1954 as a pop label by Gus Wilde. Um, it started failing quickly, uh, but then it was rescued temporarily by producer Creed Taylor, who shifted the focus to jazz. However, uh, those productions were expensive and um, uh, Gus Wilde went to Sid Nathan as a, as a savior. And um, in, in, uh, Sid bought a, a good share of the uh, label at that point. Um, we um, are running out of time, so I guess I want to finish out by playing, can I, how many minutes? One. Well, let's have the hits. Play the last audio track, and I'll talk over it. Next track, please. Okay, the original version of The Twist by Hank Ballard was uh, released on King in 1959. Um, James Brown eventually ended up more or less taking over the label. Sid Nathan died May the 5th, 1968. In 1971, uh, the King uh, was sold to Lieber and Stoller of Tennessee Recording and Publishing. They later spun off the songwriting for millions, but sold the recordings for a pittance to Gusto Records of Nashville. This is Hideaway by Freddie King, recorded in 1961. Little boy. When you touch my hand and you talk sweet talk, I got a knocking in my knees and a wobble in my walk. I'm trembling and I'm shaking. And when you take me in your arms to talk romance, my heart stops doing and the saint bodies dance and I'm patting. Oh, Someday we'll have time to talk about producers. Ed King, Ralph Bass, Hal Neely, Johnny Otis, Charles Sperling, Dewey Bergman. And just the tiny bit of the next segment, because it's. James Brown. Thank you very much. The nice thing about the fact that this is being recorded and will be up on the excuse me, be up on the website is that Dave will be able to provide the PowerPoint so within a couple of months you'll be able to not only hear this but, but see it. But it's we are an audio uh, organization and I think it's just very helpful if uh, if there are technical problems if people just keep going with uh, the microphone and the audio. I thank thank you very much, David. It's really, really, really interesting.